Okay, so our final presentation today um, is from Andrew Bender from uh, DZS. Uh, now, Andrew, as many of you will be aware, is the CTO at DZS, uh, developing, coordinating, and, and promoting the technology strategy, not just for DZS, but all of its uh, strategic partnerships uh, and its industry engagement, uh, both in, from an SDN, broadband access, 5G, and connected premises um, environment. Uh, Andrew's a regular speaker on our webinars, and uh, he has had previous senior roles at VMware, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and NEC. Uh, today, Andrew is going to be speaking about extreme performance optical broadband. Andrew, over to yourself. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to bring it home here and uh, go go as fast as I can, sensibly, but as fast as I can to leave some time for questions, because I know there's a lot of interest and. In We've seen a lot of questions coming in. So thank you everyone for, for joining today. Pleased to, to have, uh, have the opportunity to, to talk to you. I, I think we all agree that hearing from operators and the voice of operators is, is really the interesting part of sessions like that. And we had a number of those today. Um, I, I'm gonna talk also about the status of some customer deployments, uh, but also really engineering considerations for new services as Craig says, architectures for the new technologies that are coming online to support these, these kind of models. That's what we mean by extreme performance optical broadband. So it'll get a little technical, but we'll start with the, uh, the point of view from, from the operators. We've heard today that uh, 10 gig class PON and optical broadband has, has arrived and is now being actively deployed commercially. Uh, we are, ourselves as DZS see this trend across geographies and throughout the world. You see a cross section of, of some of our key publicly announced customers here, uh, all embracing and deploying at scale 10 gig class technology. Uh, and that includes at the, at the CO, at the head end, some cases at, at remotes, uh, what we call optical line terminals. Uh, but of course, consumer premises equipment, CTE devices, ONTs, ONUs as, as well providing the other end of, of that 10 gig class service. So as this service ramps up, uh, there, are, there are changes that happen in the network, not just in the optical distribution network and, and the equipment, but, uh, but the architecture of the network. So I'll talk a little bit, uh, a little bit more about that through the, through the session that we have today. Uh, so first, a, a good reference point is what I call the one to two gig class or, or GPON uh, type of, of deployment model. This is a good, uh, good reference case for places where optical broadband or, or PON is, is already deployed. So zooming into the network here, you see the, the CPE, the user equipment in a G984 or GPON type of, type of network. Uh, we call those things ONTs or ONUs. Um, and each optical distribution network is, is of course passive and that entails uh, splitters that facilitate multiple subscriber drops or, or connections to a distribution network. And then at the end of the network is the, the OLT of, of course. And you see a variety of options here, you know, at least in our world, the equipment that we create, chassis based systems that are very, very scalable, uh, go to very high subscriber counts and so forth but also smaller form factor distributed compact units that might be deployed out in the network or, uh, or, or deployed in a disaggregated type of model. We see, we see both models being, being embraced for, uh, for GPON, uh, but also for XGSPON as well. But doing some of the math on the, on the services here, you know, kind of adding up the, the, uh, the level of service uh, from, the, from the subscriber and how that's represented at TO or in the network core, um, you don't necessarily see a, a 128 to one type of the type of split that kind of loading in, in subscriber uh, subscriber networks. It, it depends, but characteristically, we're seeing things like uh, you know a 16, 32 to, to one being being more typical. But at that head end again, you're going to see it. For example, in a chassis based system where we have uh, something like a, a 14 slot chassis for a high scale. Uh, CO type of, of application, 16 OLT instances or OLT ports, each serving an ODN uh, on, a, on a line cart. So with that GPON class service porting uh, like a 2.4 gigabit downstream, 
you have about 500 gigabits of, of total ODN loading that's theoretically possible here. Realistically, for consumer broadband services, you, you don't see that kind of utilization um, all the time or sometimes even at peak hours. But in the architecture of systems that we have in the CO, we do have provisions to provide what we would call a non-blocking uh, connectivity into, into the core with uh, many higher order 40 gig class uplinks in, in GPON systems. So this is, again, our starting point and, and pretty typical of what we would see in a central office type of type of deployment for, for GPON in a densely deployed optical broadband service architecture. So enter XGS PON, um, and this is how the figures of merit change uh, about uh, what goes in the what goes in the subscriber prem, the CPE equipment, with uh, the new standard G9807 XGS PON being a very common choice we see in a lot of our a lot of our deployments. So Again, an ONT, ONU there supporting potentially that 10 gig symmetrical service um, at the subscriber and uh, each ODN then having up to 10 gigabits of, of capacity. The capacity of, of the OLT or the head end equipment uh, has, has not changed or has actually kept pace with the ODN density that you would see for GPON. So here again, maybe 14 slots of 16 port OLTs or 16 ports of, of ODN. So now you're looking at something on the order of 2,200 gigabits of, of ODN loading uh, or total capacity or about 2.2 terabits as, as we say. Uh, so to accommodate that, we've, we've made changes in the architecture of these kinds of systems to, to use 100 gig or multiple 100 gig class uplinks from, from these systems. and. If you look at what, what happens on the subscriber side that may be driving uh, transition to, to XGS and, and 10 gig pond, uh, a variety of services that are familiar to all of us, uh, but you know even, even ones that we take for granted like video services, UHD, H265, whether over the top or, or, or linear is, is about 25 megabits per stream and in a busy hour you're having uh, two, two and a half, maybe three subscribers simultaneously using that. That's uh, the better part of 100 megabits per per subscriber, right there, and uh, that doesn't include connected devices or gaming or special applications, work from home, all those kind of things are potentially additive on that. So, uh, a pretty consistent drive to increase the the capacity of of the network. But the other interesting factor that I want to talk about is advanced services. In in many cases, still, you know, despite 4K, UHD, new services, even things we haven't thought of yet. On the residential consumer broadband access side, we, we don't see full consumption of 10 gig class services. But what is very attractive is the notion of using these economics of, of PON to reach other service types or, or provide uh, high performance networks for, for enterprise, uh, for mobile transport, and backhaul. And these other service types really do drive a higher characteristic utilization uh, port. Uh, at the port level of the CPE and uh, of the ODN as as well. So this has really driven us to a direction where fundamentally we have changed the architecture of what happens in the CO and, and beyond to allow the full realization of scale deployment of XGS PON or 10 gig class services. So uh, once again, if you do that math on uh, say, for example, 14 plots of, of 16 ports of ODNs at 10 gig, you have 2.2 terabits and with these high demand services, you may actually have about that much traffic leaving the system. And in turn, with different service types or uh, upstream services, uh, you, you may need actually more upstream transporter capacity than you have downlink capacity uh, because of uh, port groups and uh, differentiated services and, and things like that. So. All that to say, we're, we're making some uh, fundamental changes in the capacity leveling up the technology and chassis based systems and, and also in distributed systems to support a higher order, about an order of magnitude change in the performance of the core and the packet fabrics and, and so forth to fully uh, fully realize the promise of, of XGS PON and these 10 gig class technologies. So the, the other thing that, that's important to talk about is services management for these advanced services. You know, we talked a bit about consumers, but also enterprise and, and, and mobile. These networks are, are more and more composed of both 
physical network functions like OLTs and ONTs, you know, aggregation devices, packet switches, routers, et cetera, uh, but also virtualized functions or software components uh, that are associated with mobile services, enterprise networks, uh, internet and online services. Uh, and, and that extends all the way down to CPE devices as well, where we have on-prem some service intelligence that, that's there also and that is dynamic uh, to provide new capabilities or dynamic capabilities for the, for the subscriber. So being able to deliver services in such a network uh, for, for different classes of users with different needs and, and support that uh, the dynamic nature of the service demand requires that we have a, a new approach to automating the deployment of the, of the network this gives rise to uh, a common framework type of approach that we call network aware service orchestration. We see some of our customers doing this today, uh, rolling out this, this software defined uh, technology to, to orchestrate and automate the, the deployment of these services across those virtualized and physical functions. And in turn, this enables specialized service networks, which might have shared or dedicated infrastructure. And of course, the OLTs and ODNs often are going to be shared. You know, some of the upstream packet networks, uh, some aspects are going to be dedicated. But the 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 new new idea and a concept in the mobile world we refer to as network slicing is that you have independent, differentiated pools of resources and maybe even logical networks. Uh, that are different for, for each service class, service type, or, or network slice. And this is enabled by that software-driven or software-defined network control system. Um, so you might have one of these resource partitions for residential services, enterprise services, and then mobile services uh, to provide differing capabilities on the same network, uh, supporting those range of, of high-value commodity services together with the common architecture. So with that, I will uh, now hand it back to Craig and the rest of our esteemed team to, for the questions and panel. 